Dear brothers and sisters of the Methodist Church, peace be with you. Today is the launch of the celebration of the 135th anniversary of the Methodist Church in Singapore. It is also the 135th anniversary Thanksgiving service of Wesley Methodist Church, our first church. Therefore, let us together give thanks and praise to God for all his blessing on us. The passage of scripture that we have just read is familiar to many of us, and especially for us Methodists. We all know that this is John Wesley's favorite passage to show why a Christian would relentlessly pursue perfection throughout his life. And by that, he meant the pursuit of holiness, scripture holiness, and social holiness. As we launch our MCS 135 celebrations, let us use this passage of scriptures to remind one another of this important confession of every Methodist, that is to love God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and in the same way, to love our neighbor as ourselves. Matthew chapter 22, verse 36 to 40, and Mark chapter 12, verse 30 to 31, these two passages record Jesus' response to the lawyer's questions, which is the greatest commandment of all, which is the most important. But it is only in Luke accounts do we learn that Jesus actually turned the question back to the lawyers to answer himself. Jesus said, which is written in the law, how do you read it? After the lawyer had answered his own question, he continued with another question for Jesus. And who is my neighbor? Jesus then told the story of the Good Samaritans. This story is not recorded in any other gospel. Let us pray that, that through this familiar Bible story, the Holy Spirit helps us to understand the close relationship between loving God with all our heart and mind and loving our neighbors in the same way. First, let us listen to how the lawyer answered his own question. Every devout Jew would have memorized these scriptures, Shema. Listen. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. And love your neighbors as yourself. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 18. Of course, when it comes to the interpretation of Scripture, the lawyer or teacher of the law holds the authority from this dialogue between the lawyer and Jesus, it is clear that where the lawyer was concerned to inherit eternal life depends on one's actions and behavior. And so he asked Jesus, what shall I do? This lawyer, who comes ready with an answer, replied Jesus' question, rather confidently. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. When the lawyer heard how Jesus had agree with him, he was very pleased and proud of himself. After all, isn't this just what all of God's elect have learned from young? It is an age-old talent that everyone knows. He was so sure of himself. But in fact, 
This episode reveals his rather superficial and cliche understanding of the law. To the lawyer, to love God means that one must do or perform adequately all the required religious riches. Then that should be enough to demonstrate and satisfy the greatest commandment. In fact, doing so can even add to one's credit and merit for loving God. You can see why then that with such teaching from the lawyers, the Jews so hard to follow the law carefully as that was the way to eternal life. This may seem simple and straightforward, but in fact, it is very difficult to do. This is easier said than done. As for loving one's neighbors, this is probably even harder to accomplish when compared to loving God. This is because those we can see are harder to get along with than the God who we cannot see. Even for people from the same race or the same family, we all have different personalities and temperaments. How then will we be able to love our neighbors as ourselves? What more when there are no rules or guidelines to decide who counts as our neighbor? Take for example, in Jesus' time, the Gentiles and other races were considered unclean. Could they be counted as neighbor of this lawyer? In the lawyer's mind, there was a rather conventional and rigid understanding of how to love one's neighbor. And this has exposed a blind spot and an inconsistency in his beliefs. That is, a neighbor was entirely by his personal choice and decision. This is why he asked, and who is my neighbor? Jesus then told a well-known story of the Good Samaritans. You see, in the eyes of these lawyers, the Samaritans are in the group labor NMN, not my neighbors. The Samaritans are not part of God's elect, being a people of mixed blood and apostates. They are not under God's blessing. And that's certainly not on the list of neighbors for people like this lawyer. In this story, after the man was beaten up by the robbers, the first characters to come onto the scenes were a priest and a Levite. They were educated men of reasons. From young, they have learned to recite the Shema scriptures and verses in Deuteronomy 6, 5 and Leviticus 19, 18. They saw the man who had been attacked and seriously injured. The Bible says they saw and they passed by on the other side. Only the Samaritan, whose heart was moved by the sigh, came forward to pick the man up, put him on his own donkey, and brought him to the inn and took care of him. Jesus asked the lawyer of these three, the priest, the Levite, the Samaritans, who is the neighbors to the man who was robbed and beaten? The lawyer replied, the Samaritan, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Note this. When Jesus asked, who is the neighbor of this man who was robbed? He was actually asking the lawyer to consider, who is my neighbor? He could also be asking the lawyer to consider, whose neighbor am I? If the Samaritan could become the neighbor of the man who was assaulted, then 
Could the lawyer also become the neighbors of someone in need? Jesus was also reminding us not to just keep asking, who is my neighbor? But instead, we are to ask, whose neighbors am I? In telling this story, Jesus was speaking not just to that lawyer or the people who worship God at that time. He is also speaking to us now, the people who go to church to worship, reminding us that loving a neighbor requires the same kind of effort that we put into loving God that is with all our heart and all our mind. This then is the spiritual formation that John Wesley sought to fulfill in his life. He was constantly persuading the believers that he pastors to commit to a lifetime of pursuing holiness. And this holiness is both inward and outward holiness. By inward holiness, it means to believe, trust, love, worship, imitate, and obey God with our whole heart and mind and strength. And outward holiness is to love our neighbor that refer to anyone and everyone. Religious belief, if not lived out in the presence of others and not in interaction with others, has no place or purpose at all. Thus, John Wesley often emphasized that our holiness must be seen in our response towards our neighbors. In his track, The Character of a Methodist, he pointed out that these traits were not just marks of Methodists, but indeed, they ought to be marks of all Christians. He highlighted eight traits of Methodists. Always joyful, give thanks in all circumstances, pray unceasingly, loves God and loves his neighbor, is pure in heart, does the will of God, does no evil by word or action, does good to all men, including neighbors, strangers, friends, and enemies. Such a character is to be sought after not just by John Wesley, who lived from 1703 to 1791, but as member of the Methodist Church in Singapore in 2020, our daily lives must also demonstrate the spiritual fruit of a life of inward and outward holiness. To pursue inner holiness and outer holiness, that is the mark of all Methodists. The question is, how are we able to live such a life? How can we sustain such a lifestyle? Wesley acknowledged that this is a discipline requiring others to provide mutual support and to watch over us. He suggested two ways. Firstly, the believers must live in the grace of God. Only God's infinite grace can renew and sustain us spiritually to live abundantly holy lives. This is by the means of grace, which include scripture study, prayer, fasting, the communion of saints, which is fellowship and Christians' conferencing, the breaking of bread, private and corporate worship. By such means of grace, Christians may train to live godly spiritual lives. In that way, we are able to have grace in abundance, sufficient to love and care for others. This is what John Wesley called work of piety. Secondly, Believers must have others journeying with them in holy living. 
Wesley believed that those who try to live a holy life by themselves will find that it is quite impossible unless there are Christians close to us to give encouragement and support. Wesley stressed that Christians must be in connection with one another. Such connection helped Methodist Christians to live healthy spiritual lives and grow. And the church will be even more fruitful in her mission. John Wesley said that we must have such work of mercy, meaning good works done to others, including neighbors, strangers, friends, and enemies. Otherwise, devout worship on its own is quite meaningless. When Methodists are connected, many things that individuals or small groups are unable to accomplish become possible and can be well accomplished. Christians cannot isolate themselves, but must be in mutual connection. Only there can we demonstrate a more fruitful and abundant body of Christ. Let me conclude my sermon. John Wesley and many of his followers live their lives caring for the poor, the weak, and the sick regardless of whether they believe in the Lord or not. Jesus wanted the lawyer and us to become a neighbor to them. Now, as we made this celebrate 135 years of church planting in Singapore, we must remember that it is God who put us in Singapore that was founded 200 years ago, that we may become good neighbors with the citizens and residents here for this last 135 years. We are not so great as to think that as a church, we can single-handedly do that much for society or accomplish great undertakings all by ourselves. But it is in joint effort with the residents and others Christians that we have built school, reduced illiteracy, raised standard of education from preschool to mainstream school to highest education to ensure that all have opportunity to attend good schools, to receive nurturing, and to become talents in different professions. With our close neighbors, we work hard to raise the status of women, eradicate drug abuse, and build orphanages and old age homes to provide comfort and solace to the poor and weak, take care of families and those who are vulnerable, while guarding and passing on this harmonious and diverse homeland, built by the sweat and tears of benevolent forebears. Therefore, this 135th anniversary celebration is not just our own celebration with fellow Methodists, sisters and brothers from our churches, but we must include the neighbors we have had for these 135 years. People from all walks of life, friends and different faiths different races, different languages from near and far to share in the blessing that God has given to the Methodist Church. We want to share this rich blessing with our neighbors. Let us do this, loving God, serving together. May God bless our neighbors. May God bless our nation, Singapore.